Good morning, everyone. Uh, We are November 3rd, 2020, which is an historical day. Whenever you're watching this, either in real time, soon after, or years later, this will be a notable day because it's the election in the United States. Tremendous amount of tension, energy, and fear and expectation is tied up in this day. So let us be a strong force um, for true for true wisdom and true calmness, which is to live in the light. Let's begin with a prayer. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Master Paramahansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, humbly we bow to all. Dearest friend Swami Kriyananda, guide us and bless us. Help us in these tumultuous times to feel the unchanging thread of thy divine presence within us. Help us to be calm and courageous and to understand that the events of the world are just a passing show, that the deeper drama is always the soul's relationship with God, and that each of us are here to live out our karma as given to us by the divine, so that ultimately we can transcend all karma and be free forever in thy light. Bless all those in this country and in the world, whose hearts and minds are deeply caught up in the world events and whose destinies will be influenced. May the karma of the U.S., may all the goodness of the U.S. and the deep sincerity of the citizens of this country triumph over division and hatred that the plan of Babaji and Jesus to resolve the great dilemmas of this age be brought forth in all its beauty and glory. May we be instruments of that plan and may all seeking hearts be filled with thy love. Om. Peace. Amen. So, I'm pausing to wonder if I should work with what I have in front of me or I should address the events of the day. It's almost like the events of today are not really the events. It's after today that the issues are really going to come to a head. So we have tomorrow and the next day and who knows how many more days after that. In uh, Light Bearer, I talk about, there's a place where Swami was talking about the difficult times that Master said would come specifically to America. We have very good karma overall, he said, but have a little bit of bad karma to pay off, primarily for racial prejudice, especially against the American Indians, and of course more recently against dark-skinned people in general. But Master said the karma of the country overall is good. In, In looking at the present situation, all I can say repeatedly is it depends on the karma of the country. Swamiji often said that it's not the political leaders that determine the destiny of the world or the destiny of a country. The leaders are elected because the destiny of the country is set. And bear in mind, we're not Americans in our souls, those of us who live in this country, or Germans, or Ethiopians, or whatever we happen to be. We we are in the astral world. We look for that environment and that... that uh, karma that's going to be acted out that will serve our higher uh, our higher purpose, which is to become attuned to God. So none of us are here by accident, and nobody who's elected or defeated is really going to determine the direction of this country. They will, or and the world, they will act according to the destiny 
of the whole. And how a country exactly gets karma is very confusing to me in a certain sense, because it's not the same souls coming back over and over again necessarily, although we do, I'm sure, play out dramas that take longer than one lifetime to carry out. But the, the prosperity of America was based on the destruction of the native peoples who were here. And, and Master often cited that as the real bad karma of this country because it was, it was nefarious in every respect. Then, of course, there was the process of slavery. Much of that bad karma was paid off in the Civil War um, when so many thousands of people were killed and suffered. But nonetheless, that karma too, it's race hatred, religious bigotry, um, narrow-minded material selfishness, greed, and materialism. This is what Master describes in Autobiography of a Yogi. So the antidote to those things are not really politics. The antidote to those things, those are qualities of the human heart. And if those aberrations are in place, they have to be corrected. So a country is an entity of some sort in an astral way. It probably has guiding deities. It probably has guiding devas. Swami tells the story of some sadhu talking about the deity in charge of India and the deity in charge of China having a, a, a conference about the fact that uh, the Chinese were feeling aggressive and needed to have an incursion into India. This was many years ago. And then the, the two deities agreed that the Chinese would, in, would, would invade up to a certain you know, latitude, longitude there, but not further. And they did exactly that and then withdrew, even though there was no clear military reason for it. Because there are higher forces. Master spoke of uh, Hitler being influenced by the, the Himalayan masters to make certain mistakes so he could be defeated because the karma had shifted at that point and it needed to go in another direction. So, quite apart from whatever we can say about the objective facts of world events or the subjective facts of world events, there is a deeper reality from which the world is truly governed. So that's where whatever degree of calmness and acceptance we have and courage in the face of obstacles or disappointments or or difficulties. It's the only place where it can be. So I'm going to leave it at that point because we're going to have lots more opportunities to talk about it. And I'm going to talk about the same thing now. I'm going to talk about our vow to Divine Mother inviting her to discipline us and guide us. Yesterday I talked about discipline and I, for some reason I felt to tell lots of stories about mothers and their children and the force and the power of that. I also wanted to just, I, I never really clearly, I felt, focused in on what the actual word discipline means. Um, discipline, it's sort of like we're, we're, uh, we're a force. Uh, our, our karma, our karma, our desires, our longings, our angers, our regrets, all of these things, it's this force that just moves us. I, I was meditating on this recently, just reflecting about how my energy keeps constantly being drawn back into preoccupation with certain difficult relationships, with certain situations that I have to deal with. The past few years for me have been filled with adventures, with spiritual adventures of challenges to perfect love. That's what I would call it. And, and the discipline is that God keeps smacking me up against things. It's like my, the force of my energy wants to go in a certain way, and then, and then the discipline is a force that, that the guru puts down, if you're listening, where you'll just hear it. I was talking yesterday about having those negative energies about the goddess Durga. So that was just a force that was running out of me. And in that particular case, God used a monkey and just slammed me up against the monkey. It's just like a mother will, you know, a child is small enough that the mother can move the child. You know, you're just doing the wrong thing. I remember being a child and being conscious of the fact that my, my, my father, who was a, big, a biggish man, he was six feet and rather husky, I, I think of him more, not that he disciplined me, but he could just pick me up and move me. And it was, there was nothing I could do. And especially, of course, when you're a toddler or a baby, your parents can just pick you up and move you. 
And you can kick and scream all you want. They just can carry you away. And of course, the guru can do exactly the same. And even though he doesn't, although sometimes he does, just literally physically move you, it's sort of like there's this force that you run up against. And if you're, if you're interested in that discipline, then you'll keep running up against that force. It'll be mental. Or it'll be, it'll, it'll actually, some, not, it won't always be mental, but it will also be mental. Or it be, will be emotional. Just be pushing in a certain direction. And, and either a voice comes or a feeling comes or a circumstance comes. It just won't let you push any farther in that direction. Just like the mother saying, no. You're not, you're not going to be allowed to do this. And sometimes if we have a big enough tantrum, we can break through and do it anyway. We ignore the, the, the guru won't necessarily impose his discipline as forcefully sometimes as a mother can. But he will still, he'll discipline us. I remember at a certain point in my life, I had, uh, I just had these very strong desires that were very, um, not really helping me, but they were just very strong desires. And I remember in the, in my early, in my meditation in the morning, I would say to, to Divine Mother and to Master, if you give me the opportunity to do the wrong thing, I will do the wrong thing. I can promise you I do not have the willpower to restrain myself. So the only way that this is going to work is you're going to have to prevent me from having the opportunity to behave badly. And then I, I would say frankly, and when the time comes, I'm not going to be pleased. I'm going to argue with you and try to find a way around it. But in my moment of clarity, this is what I want. And I'll be darned if day after day, all of my uh, mischievous tendencies were thwarted. Circumstances just didn't allow it. Um, and th- that's that's one way that the discipline comes. The other way the discipline comes is it just takes away from you something that you want. You have an attachment and you think you're going to get away with it. Sister Gyanamata says, and of course she's, she's operating at a very high level, but we need to know how high the mountain is. She said, I came to realize that I had to give everything to Master. Even those things that were mine by right, is how she put it. Even those things that harmed no one. So I just, she, she said she wasn't, the guru was not going to allow her to hold on. And I certainly, over the course of many years, I, I've really had to live through that same thought. Because if it's an attachment that warps my judgment, if it's an attachment that makes me unable to see the will of God with calm acceptance and joy, it doesn't matter how harmless it seems. It's not harmless because we hold it tighter than we hold our love for God. Now, it isn't that God wants us to suffer, and this Swami makes very clear to me, has made very clear to me on many occasions. It's that he wants us to love God first and not be deluded into thinking that anything except love for God is essential for our happiness. I recently have been rereading, I just finished rereading Viktor Frankl's book, A Search for Meaning. I haven't read it in decades. Um, somebody borrowed the book from me about four or five years ago and it just was returned, so I picked it up to read it. It's very short, just a couple of hours of reading. And it describes life in a concentration camp. And he, even though it was unthinkable, in fact, he himself says, Viktor Frankl says, because he was a, in Auschwitz, he was held captive for three years. He talks about also the what happens afterwards. He says, as time passes and you look back on it, he said, you really don't know how you were able to bear it. He said, you just don't know how but somehow you did. And, but what, what the power of his writing about that is, is that he said your life was reduced to the, to the absolute, absolute bare minimum, which was that you still had a body and you were still breathing. He said you lost everything else, absolutely everything else, dignity, respect, a future, uh, a position. You didn't even have a name, you just had a number. And, you know, death was just right in front of you all the time. 
but he said it it he 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 tried to talk about how extraordinarily powerful it was to realize that you only had one choice which is that you just had to endure with grace and dignity and and he is he, not a religious tract but he refers the inner life well it's a great opportunity to become a saint and he said if Viktor Frankl said there were examples he said there weren't a lot of examples but he said the fact that there were any showed even those in the concentration camps what was possible he said people who when every ounce of your energy and everything that you were wanted you to be selfish there were those who who never thought about themselves but sacrificed continually for others even when there was almost nothing to sacrifice they still found a way to do it and he said it showed it showed all of them why they were there and what was possible well when we say to the guru discipline me it it may make us a little bit nervous we're actually saying to divine mother discipline me because we're saying i want to do it your way not mine but there's nothing frightening in that in the sense that she understands what we're capable of there was a, a disciple of master and uh i can't remember exactly the context but master babied him and even between them explicitly master says i call this one my baby because i'm babying him and the and the, the disciple said yes sir <laughs> you know you are you're babying me meaning i'm just not tough enough to do i love you but i can't face it and sometimes we say to divine mother i can't face it and sometimes she's she's gentle with us but not always because she wants more for us sometimes than we want for ourselves so discipline is sort of like um showing us our boundaries showing us how far we can stray off of our one pointed devotion to god but discipline me guide me they're two different things in in the vow here so guidance i think is the inspiration that we feel it takes discipline to receive guidance it takes discipline to be able to follow guidance but guidance is when um our path is laid out in front of us who who am i supposed to be what am i supposed to do you know how am i supposed to express i was listening to a a talk of swami ji's not too long ago i often listen to ask me about truth it's one of my favorites of his recordings it was one of the last series may have been the last series he did in 2012 and let's see the question was about having a a mission or a destiny so ami was very casual about that he was very casual about um saying that people have a destiny he said most people's lives it we have so many lessons to learn that it isn't as if we're just settled down on this one thing. I do feel that sometimes people hold back waiting for this one thing to attract them and tell them what they're supposed to do. When in fact, most of us really just don't have a destiny. Someone like Swami Kriyananda had a destiny. He was he he had this work to do for master and master told him. But most of us just do the best we can. to bring a little light to this world in whatever ways we're inclined to do it. You know, one of the things that Viktor Frankl said which was very deeply moving to me. I'll just be specific about him. He he went he he was imprisoned in his early 20s. He was held for 3 years, so he wasn't he was some years away from 30 when he was released. So he has he had a very long and very successful career act- afterwards he was already a certified psychiatrist and he went back into to psychiatric care for people and he wrote dozens of books and he started a whole school of psychotherapy in vienna he was austrian um and became extremely well known world renowned but this little book a search for meaning which was um a chronicle of his time in the concentration camp 
sold millions and millions and millions of copies in like 20 or 19 or 20 different languages and went after edition and edition. He had planned to publish that book without his name on it anonymously. He felt who it came from didn't matter. It was just the story. He also wrote it therapeutically. He said he wrote it in nine days in 1945, just after he was released. It was just putting down all the thoughts and the experiences that he'd had because he not only experienced it, but he observed what he was experiencing as a, a psychiatric medical doctor. So he, but that book made him made him known and was the most successful thing he did, even though he wrote, he said, dozens of other books because he was an academician and very pr productive. But then he, he went on to say, he, he, he said he tells his, his students, you can't pursue success. He said, it, 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 he uses this word, you can't pursue it. It ends who's naturally from living correctly. He says the same with happiness. You can't pursue happiness. You have to live correctly. And then success and happiness are the byproduct of your having lived correctly. And so what he says is, and he's not speaking about the disciple-guru relationship, he says, feel what it is that your conscience is telling you to do, and then to the best of your ability and understanding, do what your conscience is telling you to do. And he said, and success inevitably will follow, and then he puts parenthetically with an exclamation point, eventually. You know, meaning not necessarily immediately. Now eventually for us on the path of self-realization means in some lifetime or another. I remember a man who was part of our congregation here who was very, very successful in his business. He just had an instinct for, an intuition for what was needed and he just had, and he had the karma to be in the right place at the right time. And Swami remarked about him. He said, people look at him and think it's effortless success. He said, but they can't see all the lifetimes in which he worked in order to reach the point where it was, quote, effortless. This is what um, Dr. Frankel is saying. If we do what our conscience tells us to do, success is inevitable eventually. Now, what is our conscience? I mean, there is a moral compass that is inherent within us. But when we become disciples, when we become devotees, we, we make that moral compass an active relationship with the loving conscious force. And that loving conscious force is personified as the power and the presence of the guru or the power and the presence of divine mother. So what is guiding us? What is guiding us is that higher vibration. I mean, that's what your conscience is. Your conscience is the higher vibration. We're just actively, dynamically inviting that higher vibration into us. And it's, it's not so easy, it's not effortless to just be able to hear the, the guidance of the guru because we have many voices within us. We have subconscious, conscious, and superconscious. And what we're really trying to follow is the superconscious, the divinely inspired side of ourselves. But the subconscious also has a lot to say. And a lot of things that the subconscious suggests to us, quote, feel right because they're completely consistent with who we already are. So it's just a flow with the way things are. And this is where all of these teachings become a razor's edge. You, and, and very simply, what you have to, we have to do is we have to train ourselves to be able to tell the difference from my inner voice, which is just the voice of habit and subconsciousness, to the real whisper of the Master and the real whisper of Divine Mother. And, uh, the way we find out the difference is we test the water and when we crash and burn, and when we crash and burn repeatedly, we begin to get a feeling for what the true divine guidance is. And also we have to learn it's not enough to hear it. One also has to know how to work with it. I remember on one notable occasion, I was w working with a group of people. We had to make some decisions about the direction of a project. And I, I really had what I, I, I felt to be an intuitive flash of what we should do. And, but then, instead of working sensitively with that intuition, I made it a hammer and tried to compel people around me to cooperate. My only excuse was this was about almost 40 years ago that this happened. 
not that it's never happened since, believe me it has, but this was a very dramatic. And using my guidance as a hammer, I alienated everybody. And I finally said, I finally wrote a note and said, you know, maybe my guidance is true, but even if it is, I've polluted the water of that guidance by my egoic involvement with it. So I simply withdrew. I totally 100% withdrew from the conversation. Everybody settled down, made exactly the decision that I had recommended. Now, I'm not saying that's that I'm right. I'm saying that I could feel that it was right intuition, but what you do with it is also important. The mere fact that you're guided does not in itself bring success. Then you have to discipline yourself or allow Master to discipline you in order to be able to follow that guidance. And then we gradually find out that some of our guidance is full superconscious, some of it is just a good idea, and some of it is complete delusion. I remember in a project that I was working on, this was back in the 70s, I, I was in charge of this project. It was a fundraising effort. And anyway, I just made some really dumb decisions and put out a lot of energy and dragged a lot of people with me, and none of it worked out right. And at the end of it, Swami just said to me, Oh, Asha, he said, whenever your ego gets involved, you make terrible decisions. <laughs> and he was absolutely correct. There had been, uh, there were just all these polluting ideas in, in the decisions that I made. They were all just based on what I wanted. And I acted as if it was guidance, but it wasn't. And I could tell the difference. Even at the time, I could tell the difference. I just didn't want to listen. But a few of those experiences you begin to be able to feel when your ego is involved. And in the other instance, the guidance was true. It really was. Not merely because people followed it later, but it was just the right decision. But the ego got involved, and then I made terrible decisions. And there's just there's no way around it that I know of. We just have to live through it, and we have to have the courage to try. If we don't have the courage to try then we don't bring any fresh experience into it. We can't just sit on the fence and, and wait to be safe. Um, uh, the, you know, My friends and I would sometimes talk about the different ways of progressing on the spiritual path. There was the cautious, careful, don't make a mistake way, and there was the fling yourself out there, crash and burn, learn what you can and start over way. Um, people have different temperaments. Crash and burn is not a bad idea. When Swami Kriyananda decided to pursue building a temple in New Delhi for Master, when he was a representative of SRF, and it was it seemed like a good idea, he said many. He told us the story of it. It resulted in him being expelled from Self Realization Fellowship. He tells that story in many different places, so I won't tell the whole story. But it resulted in what appeared to be the greatest tragedy of his life although it turned out to be a great blessing in the end. Life is complicated. But he himself said, when he started on that project, he didn't feel Master's guidance and blessing in the way he was accustomed to feel it. But he thought he would experiment and see what would happen if he went forward anyway. I thought that was very, very interesting. What courage! Because he needed to be able to know the difference, and it it turned out to be catastrophic. It was divinely intended in a certain way. Um, Swami has many explanations for it. But the only part that really counts is, well, I'm not sure, as he put it, but he couldn't think of anything else to do. So he went forward to test his intuition and to pay attention to the result. Now that's what it is really to be a disciple. Not to play it safe, not to be afraid, but just forthright and boldly seek the truth with the humility to listen when God guides us, disciplines us, and reveals it to us. God bless you, my friends.